Books episode of the All the Books Show, where we normally talk book news, author news, and literary news. But today we're talking to Nick. How, how did you refer to him as? <laughs> so it's Batman Day. Yes, it's Batman Day, everyone. And so we thought, well, we need a special bat guest. Mm-hmm. So yes, I refer to our guest Steve Englehart today mm-hmm. as a comic book legend. Yeah, uh, which he thought means really that you've just been doing it so long that yeah. it's more a statement on how old yeah. you are than, <laughs> than you know your contributions which i disagree with mm-hmm. he's a legend in the comic book industry based yeah. on his own merits but yes absolutely we're going to be talking to steve Englehart about batman today this interview i feel like came about in the f- most unusual way of any interview that we've ever done maybe go on well last year i was at this comic book store and i picked up uh, issue one of a Jurassic Park comic book series. Yeah. It was right before your birthday. And I yeah, said, oh, I'll get, this. I'll get this for Eric for his birthday. Uh-huh. You know, And then I was looking at the authors and I was like, oh, it'd be really cool if I could get somebody to sign this. Uh-huh. So Steve Englehart has a great website. Right. SteveEnglehart.com is a great website. Mm-hmm. And so I, I found it. You know, he had a little commentary about the comic books. I found a contact info. Mm-hmm. I just kind of told him what I wanted to do. And he was like, yeah, sure. You know, and then we sort of got to chatting a little bit about the Jurassic Park series mm-hmm. that he wrote. And then we chatted a little bit about Batman. And uh-huh. So I sent him the comic book to sign for you. And I put in one I, of my... You put in your own Fantastic Four. One of my childhood <laughs> Fantastic Fours and just thought, well, if he's got time. Yeah. Uh, so he signed both of those, sent them yeah. right Congratulations. back. Congratulations. That was about a year ago, yeah. and then uh, I got that it, framed. I know you did. I got that framed in a nice little case in my uh, in my house. Yeah, it's cool. It's super cool. The Jurassic Park one. I don't I, know where Nick I keeps his Oh, I've got it. Oh, I've got it in a place of honor. <laughs> so this year, when we were talking about Batman, I thought, uh-huh. oh, I should. I'll reach out to Steve Englehart again, see yeah. if he's game to do the interview. And sure enough, he was. Yeah. So it came together pretty quickly, uh, and we got to chatting uh, before we started rolling the mics. You know, right. I called him a comic book legend, yeah. which he was on the fence about whether or not he liked that. <laughs> And he was saying basically that his um, that his his lead in to DC, he got hired when when DC was basically in bad shape, and they yeah. sort of had lured him away from Marvel and was like, "Fix this, please." Uh-huh. So, uh, l- but let's get into the interview. Late- Steve Englehart. All the books presents author spotlight. DC is the one that's in bad shape at this point because Marvel's kind of taken all the Oh, focus. yeah. Okay. And so yeah. DC calls you in to kind of come in and revamp these characters. And so I imagine you probably had a lot of latitude to do that. Yeah. They, you know, Marvel had, to its eternal credit, had given all of us complete freedom when wow. we were over there. So everything that we had done, for better or for worse, was on us, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, and... You know, things had gone well enough that uh, when they brought me over, I mean, that's why they brought me over. And they basically said, you can have complete freedom over here, too, which I thought was interesting because I was going to do both of those books, Justice League and Batman, for Julie Schwartz. And Julie Schwartz was well known as a hands-on editor, a good guy and an intelligent guy, but an editor who liked to be involved in everything. So I said, well, uh, you know. Can you fix that up with Julie? And, and I was talking to Jeanette Kahn, who was the new publisher. She had just inherited the company, which is why she was making changes. Uh, and so she did talk to Julie, and Julie turned out to be very supportive all the way through. Well, it's funny that you say that about Julie Schwartz, because I love comics of that era. And whenever I'm, I'm reading one that was sort of under his tenure, it seems like every third panel would have an asterisk and a little note from Julie at the bottom saying, you know, see this issue or see that. So it, it's pretty clear just reading that, that he was the type who, who liked that sort of oversight. He did. Well, I mean, the story was I never I never I lived in California and he was in New York for one thing. But I mean. Um, what I'd always heard was that when it came time to do the next issue of a book, he would call the writer in and they would sit there and work it out together. It was very much a hands-on sort of thing. So it was, you know, but Julie, again, was, he was an intelligent, sensitive editor. And I, you know, I don't know what he said when Jeanette told him this is how it was going to work, but whatever it was, I mean, he, he rolled with it. And, and as I say, was, was a pleasure to work with. Well, it seems like that kind of freedom would have been really rare for someone in your position. So I imagine like, you know, as as someone who who is creative and who suddenly like had that kind of freedom that that must have really been sort of invigorating career wise. No, so were you drawn specifically to Batman or was that more of a, an assignment that you got? 
No, no, I was drawn to it. Um, okay. You know, I started reading comics in the 50s when stories were not at all memorable, but there was Dick <laughs> Sprang. There was Dick Sprang doing some of the Batman art. And for people who don't know, I mean, Dick Sprang did, worked in really forced perspective. Things were always huge and endless. And you really had this sense of this other reality mm -hmm. uh, when he drew Batman. And I love that. So Batman, and again, in the 50s, you had Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, mm -hmm. and that's pretty much it. Yeah. I mean, later in the 50s, the, the, you know, the Flash and the Justice League and the rest of those guys came around. But uh, earlier than that, Marvel had, had gone out of the superhero business. The only superheroes were the DC superheroes, and, and Superman and Wonder Woman, you know, okay, fine. But Batman had something extra so he was mm -hmm. always he was always my favorite what always cracks me up about comics of, of the 50s and early 60s was the the disconnect between what was on the cover and what was actually in the book so you you know you think about right. batman at that time was going through sort of a, a campier phase and i you know the cover would be something like batman sold the bat cave to the joker you know and like inside that's yeah. hardly anything yeah 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 it, was, yeah it wasn't a golden age of comics in the 50s <laughs> A lot has been, you know, said about Batman's history, how he started as a darker character, but then became campier, partly due to the Adam West show. And then it seemed like it turned around. You had, you know, Denny O'Neill coming in and trying to take the character a little bit more serious. And then you come in and Batman seems to get a lot darker and eerie as well. So, I mean, was this... Yeah. It seems like that's a very conscious decision, but was the industry looking for that? Was DC looking for that? Were you, or was it just you and other writers looking to do that? Let's see how to answer all those questions. <laughs> uh, well, I was certainly looking for that. Um, I mean, again, I, you know, I can't speak to what Denny and, and Neil Adams were, were trying to do. I mean, they did make it a little more serious. They were still, I feel, dealing with the character as we knew him to that point. They were just taking him down some new passageways. Um, but my job was to kind of reimagine all these guys. And so when I, you know, reimagined the Batman, I basically had two different sides, five different points, however you want to look at it. I wanted, you know, in the first place with all these characters, and, and I include all the Justice League guys, because mm -hmm. I did this with them too in their mm -hmm. own way, was try to make them actual people. Because DC's characters were statues; they were just people in costumes, you know, statues in costumes. They didn't, they didn't have personal lives. They yeah. didn't have, you know, any anything that that was making Marvel more popular. So in all of them, I did that. But with Batman, I wanted to get to know Bruce Wayne because it is Bruce Wayne in there who's right. doing all this. It's a human being, right? It's he doesn't have any superpowers. He he's just everything he is is Bruce Wayne. And so I wanted to explore Bruce Wayne. And to that extent, I wanted him to be an adult character. And that came because of the TV show. What I was told when I took over the Batman was, you know, people still, you know, despite, I mean, Neil and Denny had done what they'd done, but they were talking to the choir, right? I mean, right. The, as far as the world was concerned, it was the Batman TV show. So I was trying to find some way to break out of that. And so I decided to make him an adult and give him a sex life, right? Mm -hmm. And this was under the comics code, so I could only sort of, you know, show it obliquely, but sure. that's where Silver St. Cloud came from, mm -hmm. to show who this person was and how he would ba balance his somewhat limited personal life with his robust Batman life and so forth. But the other thing then was the world that he was living in. In the first year of the Batman books in Detective Comics, it had been very dark and eerie. Uh, it was definitely a sort of inspired by the pulps. Uh, the villains were guys with giant monsters, but also vampires and, and, you know, strange counts who lived in middle European countries. Right, and I yeah. mean, it, and also the art was very dark. There was lots of ink on the page. You know, it was everything was, was the middle of the night, so forth. And then when Batman became popular a year in, that's when they invented a the Joker on the one hand, but also Robin on the other, and then it became Batman and Robin, and so he became more family friendly and more of a father figure, and you know life went on. But that first year had really had a nice pulp feel to it, which I thought was 
exactly right for the mm -hmm. Batman. Yeah, right? agreed. That was what that was the essence of the Batman. And then, of course, the Joker, who had been in that first year and actually first couple of years before he became like really popular, he was a homicidal maniac. Mm -hmm. And and every issue ended, every Joker story ended with him dying or <laughs> being thrown in jail. Right. And every Joker story started with the explanation as to how he had cheated death or escaped jail. Mm -hmm. And they did that for a couple of years, and then they, then they got so big, and Batman was appearing in you know several different books, and so they, they couldn't keep the continuity up, and that was another thing that went away. So I wanted to really explore who Bruce Wayne was, but I also wanted to reestablish the really pulp, dark atmosphere full of crazy things, including including the Joker. So all those things... You know, I mean, I, I did something similar with the elongated man. You know, I mean, it's like I did it with all of them, but mm -hmm. with Batman particularly, I, you know, I sat there and I thought, well, who should this guy be? I mean, who they're, you know, what they want me to do is, is like fix this guy. So who should he be? What would, what would work? That was my opinion. You know, I mean, it was like, I, I said, this is what we need. Mm -hmm. uh, if I'd been wrong, then, you know, but it, apparently, you know, as, you know, the Batman yeah, it seemed, seemed to work, work out. out. <laughs> well, we've yeah. discussed this before. Just just what you're saying, when you look at classic Marvel versus classic DC, you have a character like Peter Parker who's going through all of these things in his personal life. And it's like Peter's struggles just as a, a teenager was equal to the time given to Spider-Man. And that's yeah. something that, just as you're saying, the DC comics at that time was just you had square-jawed Superman flying in to save something and then flying away and that's it. So... It, right, and Lois Lane, was, Lois Lane was there, and she was. She even had a comic book called Superman's Girlfriend. Right. But I mean, they never went on a date. They never, you know, and you never, never did you anything. Never, you, you know, that adult people depth. do. There was never a sense of depth or reality to it. But I feel like one right. thing that that sets you apart, not just on Batman, but on all the comics of yours that I've read. For example, you're the only person who's ever made me care about Mister Miracle. But I think <laughs> that uh, I think okay. that I think that you have a way of it feels more like you're reading a novel because somehow, you, even in the limited space you're given, you really get a full sense of these characters as realistic, real people. And I think that's something that is unique to your writing. Well, thanks. I mean, that's, that is something I tried to do. I, you know, very early on in my career, I was given Captain America and, and I went home that night and I remember asking myself, if I were Captain America, what would I do? And not that I meant me personally being Captain America, but I mean, if I could put myself inside that guy's head, what would that guy do? And that's ended up being my approach to pretty much everybody. You know, I mean, I tried to think, all right, if this guy actually existed, what would he be doing? You know, and that did, uh, you know, the actual existence part then did demand personal relationships and, you know, a supporting cast and all the rest of this stuff, you know? Yeah, sure. You, you mentioned the Joker quite a bit when you were talking about him, so we can't skip over the Laughing Fish storyline that you wrote. It's a famous story now, and it shows up in a lot of different things. I mean, the Batman animated series basically did that story verbatim. Yeah. Where did that inspiration come from? I mean... Well, I wanted, you know, it's one thing to say, okay, I want to have a homicidal maniac Joker right. in, a dark, in a dark milieu. Um, but then... He has to do something. Right. I mean, you know, so I sat there and, you know, I sat there and said, well, I want a plot where it sounds like it could make sense to the Joker, but any reader can understand that it's nuts. Right. And where I, Laughing Fish is just one of those things writers get, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. it's like, oh, I'll do writing, I'll do Laughing Fish, you know, I mean, sure. there's no explanation for it other than it pops into your brain and you go, oh, yeah, okay, sure, let's do that. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I you know I thought Laughing Fish sounded interesting, and then the whole copyright thing with the Joker wanting to copyright Fish, <laughs> uh, you know, came out of that, right? But what you know what 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 it, why it worked for me was, it was obviously nuts, and everybody you know when he went to the copyright office mm -hmm. and proposed it, they said this is obviously nuts, uh -huh. which just pissed him off, right? Because he's the Joker, so that's. It was just, you know, I mean, you're just, when you're writing, you're just sort of pulling things from all directions. What do you have in your brain and how does it come together? And, mm -hmm. and particularly, you know, if you're writing comics and you're doing, I mean, I was doing a book a week, right? I mean, generally 
four four books a month was about what I could handle. And so <laughs> you get uh, you get past the first draft stage. I mean, you kind of go, all right, I got You know, I got to have a story here. What do I want to do? What do these characters want to do? You know, what do I need to do? And you know, and all that stuff comes together and. You go, yep, that works, and then you and then you go with that, you know. Right, sure. It's, it is funny where, where you see the laughing fish pop up in unexpected places. I was just this week playing the uh, the Lego DC Supervillains game with my son on Xbox, and there's a whole laughing fish segment in there, and I'm like, geez, there it is. Oh, cool. Yeah. <laughs> and so you know, you had your main Batman run, which which is one of my favorites, and I really think you know. It, it left some marks on the character that you still see in, in modern interpretations. And you would revisit Batman occasionally, one of those with the Joker Aquaman story about Laughing Fish. And that, that's, yeah. that's such an unusual pairing of, of the Joker and Aquaman. How did that come up? Well, that was an assignment. I, oh, okay. I, uh, later on, how shall I put this? I, you know, DC and I, we started out as great friends and we didn't end up as great friends. Okay. There's a number of reasons for it. But I mean... So uh, my work at DC became far less often. Okay. Uh, but I, you know, whoever was editing that book said, you know, I have an idea. You know, I'd like you to do something. And and you know, I honestly don't remember whether he said, "Let's do Batman and Joker," or Joker and Aquaman, or I can't mm -hmm. imagine I proposed it. It must have been. <laughs> uh, you know. I had revamped Aquaman back mm -hmm. in the day, you know, but I, you know, I had nothing particular I needed to say about Aquaman, but he's in the water and so are fish. So yeah, that's, that's right. Kind of, you know, that's right. It kind of went from there. Well, I, I've noticed something like as, as I've, I've read your work throughout that you seem to take every opportunity that you can to elevate women and minority characters in the issues. And I think you see that pretty clearly in the Batman Batgirl team up you do against Dr. Phosphorus, where Batgirl is given really sort of equal billing and her career as a senator, you know, has almost like the weight of that is kind of equal to the Batman story. You see it there. Yeah. You see it with, with bringing Jon Stewart to the center of Green Lantern. Mm -hmm. The use of, of Vixen and Gypsy and JLA and JSA and Hawkgirl. I mean, making Hawkgirl a, a primary character in the Justice League. So I've seen threads through that throughout. And I'm just wondering, is that something that you specifically set out to do? Yeah, in a sense. I mean, I told you I read comics in the 50s. I started writing comics in the 70s. So, you know, there was a lot of ferment and, and women's rights and black rights and, and the rest of it going on. And, and I'm totally on board with all that. When I took over the Avengers, I was told by another writer that the Scarlet Witch should do like a hex and then fall down exhausted. And I thought, <laughs> you know, I thought, well, that doesn't sound like an Avenger to me. You know mm -hmm. I mean? It's like, so I, I, the, my first splash page is the, is the Scarlet Witch being tough. You know, I mean, yeah. it's like, I think that might've set me off, but I specifically thought, I didn't put it in the terms that we're in now about white privilege and so forth, you know, but I mean, I thought, well, I mean, if these people are Avengers or Green Lanterns or whatever they are, they should be equal to everybody else. Yeah. And, and, you know, when I took over Green Lantern, Jon Stewart was the acting Green Lantern and everybody said, well, of course, Hal Jordan will come back. And I'm like, yeah, of course he will. But why does that mean that Jon Stewart has to go away again? Yeah. You know, I mean, and so, that led to having two of them, and then I threw in Guy Gardner, which mm -hmm. made three of them, and then, you know, blah, blah, blah. I mean, when I took over Captain America, it was, Capt it was called Captain America and the Falcon, so I thought the Falcon ought to have, you know, probably not as much play as Captain America, because Captain America is Captain America, but right. still, the Falcon ought to have, you know, his own storyline and his own girlfriend and his own... He shouldn't just be standing in the background all the time. That just always seemed logical to me. Why, why do superheroes and, and say some of them are better than others, you know? Yeah, well, you gave uh, you gave Falcon his wings. Yeah, so. yeah. Which which kind of blew my... I was reading that recently, and it just kind of blew my mind. I was like, oh, he's been Falcon this whole time, but only now does is he actually able to fly. It just It's just an integral part of the character, and that's the character everybody knows from the movies now, too, having those right. wings, and right. there it was, so... 
Yeah, it just really, it, I, I think it fills out the story so well because, when, you know, when you go back and read like really old JSA, I mean, there's there's Wonder Woman just being the secretary of that group. Exactly, you know? yeah. <laughs> yeah. And in your, just, in your Justice League run, I, I remember there's one moment that just cracked me up where Green Arrow is giving everybody assignments and how they're going to deal with this. And he's like, Wonder Woman, Black Canary, you guys can, I don't know, go take care of the wounded. And they're both like, what? <laughs> you know, and they're just like, yeah, no exactly. And they're like, exactly. forget it, we're doing they're, our own thing. They're in the Justice League. And and you mentioned Hawk Woman, yeah. as, as I called her, right? Right. Um, <laughs> I mean, she, was hot, she was Hawk Girl and Hawk Man was in the Justice League, but Hawk Girl, who was his partner right. and had exactly the same power was not in the and I thought well that's silly you know yeah. she should be in there and oh we have a we have a rule against two people with the same powers right. like no forget that you know and I changed her name to Hawk Woman which didn't apparently stick but uh, I mean it, it, again I'm not saying hey I'm some great social justice warrior it just seemed logical to me yeah. that you know she's well, she's just as good as he is why shouldn't she be there I mean that was kind of my point with all of them right well, I mean, it was there was obviously, uh, you know, power in these characters because for a lot of uh, people of a certain generation, Hawk Girl and uh, John Stewart are what they think about when they think of the Justice League because of the cartoon. So, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. uh, it, the writing in the comics, you know, interests the the creators of that show enough, and now those characters are, you know, uh, John Stewart for a long time is probably <laughs> more well known than Hal Jordan to uh, a generation of. Uh, you know, superhero viewers. Probably so. Well, I mean, that again was part of revamping everything, right? I mean, let's change the way DC functions. And, and a lot of that stuff did stick. As I say, DC and I didn't get along after a right. while, but I, I think I made my contribution while I was there. Absolutely. And I, you know, I love that Green Lantern run. And I, I, I think it's funny that as Hal sort of starts to get back in the fold and, and starts to become more central, I found myself being like, well, just go away. Like, I, I like the John Stewart <laughs> stuff. I would rather follow that. So like, you, you know, you could kind of see that that's happening. And then, yeah, as Eric's saying here, as, as you sort of brought back Guy Gardner from his, you know, the exile of him being in, in a vegetative state for so long. And then, right. you know, using that to really say, hey, let's see what the Green Lantern core actually is you know and how that title expanded to encompass all those characters that now to do a green lantern story without kilowog and, and john stewart and guy gardner and the, and the whole core is kind of it feels weird so i think you you know you really push that book forward well that you know i was a fan <laughs> i was a fan before i was a, a pro you know and well, i, I knew, well i mean i knew what i liked when i was reading books i knew what i liked so i just i hoped that my instincts would translate you know that i provide stuff that people would like um and i like john i gotta say i liked hal jordan too i mean yeah. i was a big hal jordan fan i didn't want to dismiss him i just thought why did the rest of these guys have to go stand in the background mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. yeah go ahead. Now I know this is uh, this is probably the question that everybody gets asked all the time, but what, what do you think it is about Batman that that is so universal that that puts him, as you said, you know, in that in that time where the other superheroes were kind of fading, Batman was still carrying the torch and still still selling books, still garnering interest. What do you think it is that that does that? Well, the way you just phrased that made me think of the '50s when you know Superman was certainly bigger than Batman, mm -hmm, right. but you know Batman, he's the one guy who has no superpowers, right? He does it all himself. His costume is extremely iconic. And, yes. and, you know, I mean, you look at other people's costumes and, and in the 40s and then in the Kirby era, they tended to have lots and lots of different colors and designs, yes. and all this and kind of stuff. And, yep. Whereas he was always, you know, it's just a, it's just a bodysuit and a, and a cape and, and, the, and the cool mask. I mean, you know, it, it was all there. And he's the one guy who works just as well in black and white because he does he doesn't rely on color so everything about him is kind of stripped down to the basics in a mm -hmm. sense it's like he's the you know i was gonna say generic and that's not it but i mean he was he's the basic guy and then everybody else sort of moves out from there to try to come up with their own costume and their own thing yeah and he did you know his world was in it i mean superman what he had Smallville and he had the Daily Planet and you know and I mean that was his world, but Batman's world had the Joker and the Penguin and mm -hmm. you know all this stuff. I mean it was dark. It was it was it started out scary. It, it ended up in forties and fifties not being scary, but you know it's a lot of it is just sort of like if you boiled superheroes down, you'd end up with Batman. Mm -hmm. You know yeah. he's right at the nexus of everything. 
And then the Joker is his perfect, is is a wonderful villain in and of himself, mm-hmm. and he's also the perfect opposite. You know, on the one hand, you've got this human being who's trying his best to do the best he possibly can. And what I always said about Batman, my Batman, I believed was sane, um, because if he if he went over the edge, he would not be as effective right. as he wants to be. So mm-hmm. he holds himself at the height of his powers, and that's it. Whereas the Joker has just gone completely over the edge and 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 enjoys it over there. And so the two of them, the the total rational intense guy and the total irrational flamboyant out out in left field guy they make a perfect couple Mm -hmm. and and again the joker would be a cool villain for anybody but he also has a you know his costume is not simple but it's but it's very striking you know so all in all just everything about that strip works if you you know i mean there were many years when it was just kind of boring, so I'm not saying it's automatic. But I mean, there's so many cool things in there that you can use to make it work. So that was my that was my job, as I understood it, to try to figure out what those were and bring them back. Yeah, well, I mean, I think what you're saying is that there's a timelessness to that character. That you know, huh. some some characters with, like you're saying, the Kirby era with all the garish colors and different things. You know, if you pull an image of that character now, it would look silly. But something like Batman at any time has always had this like stripped down classic look. So I I think that your mission to sort of be the torchbearer for those years and take what was so loved, but really say like, what's, what's under the mask and what, what are all the pieces that go into that? I, I think that's, for me, that's why I've always particularly enjoyed that take on Batman. So I thank you for that. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much for taking the time to talk with us this morning. We've been a long time admirer of your work and we appreciate you sitting down and chatting with us here. Hey, you're welcome. That was the interview. It sure was. That was a good time. It was, you know, and I I was more familiar, like before mm-hmm. we really started down this road, I was more familiar with his early Marvel stuff. Yeah. Because I had a lot of the Fantastic Four issues that he'd written when I was right. a kid. Sure. You know, I remember specifically getting some of those issues because it was just a cool time. Yeah. Got that one where the thing is depowered, you know, and he's like, oh, no. <laughs> it's just kind of an iconic yeah. cover, which is the one I had him sign, actually. Oh, there you go. So that was sort of how I was more familiar with him originally. Mm-hmm. Uh, what about you? What Do you remember what your first? It would be... Outside of Marvel, it would be Batman, Strange Apparitions, okay. I think, because I haven't read too much of like the the earlier Green Lanterns. Like you have been giving that I, full yes, deep dive. I, into, I have, I have into pure Green Lantern lore. Yeah, being a Marvel fan, yeah. I'm more familiar with you know the stuff he did on the Avengers yeah. or on, on some of the monster books, mm-hmm. Beast, the mm-hmm. X Men. Yes, the only game in town for yeah. the X Men for a while. I, I haven't been able to get my hands on those issues because I don't have the. Uh, Marvel, Marvel I just have yeah. DC, you know, so yeah. I haven't been able to read those. But yeah, his Green Lantern is really cool. Mm-hmm. You know, I think we talked about it a little in the interview, but shifting the focus onto Jon Stewart and mm-hmm. really expanding the Green Lantern core. Yeah. He did a long run on Justice League. I mean, he just, you know, he's all over the place. Well, and, you were uh, talking about how he focused on, or maybe not even just focused, just made uh, certain characters such as Wonder Woman and Hawk Girl, Hawk Woman, yeah. like prominent characters who yeah. are you know lo- no longer the secretaries. Absolutely, yeah. And f- over on Marvel, he did the same thing where like Scarlet Witch, I like how he, he says like, it's the Justice League, it's yeah. the Avengers. You're not on this team right. because you're going to be a secretary or you're the driver. You're on the team well, I think because what, you're an Avenger. Absolutely. I think what he has, what he has, what he's bringing to the table uh-huh. when he's writing these things is he's not really like being shoehorned by you know like the status quo yeah. of any particular character he's yeah. not sitting down and writing mm-hmm. like I, you know i've got tunnel vision onto what this character has right. been he sort of uh, it seems to me anyway his approach is to kind of look at the characters look at the landscape step back and mm-hmm. see like these are real people right. how do they interact how do these powers interact mm-hmm. how do these dynamics works and then writes from there yeah so it's honoring the characters but mm-hmm. it's it's expanding them beyond just yeah. their you know their their one line like bio that, right. that you often get so yeah yeah I'm a fan. It was a really ple- it was a pleasure to talk to him, yeah. and uh, I'm grateful for his time. Again, I would encourage you to check out his website. Uh, they're putting together a cool uh, Steve Englehart Batman collection that's coming mm-hmm. out in January, which we'll have here. It right. has the Strange Apparitions, has Dark Detective, and a couple of other. Uh, uh, random things will well if you're local you know we we can get you he, we've got his silver surfer mm-hmm. run we've got the doctor strange a lot of steven Gilhart in our collection uh w- within uh, the southern tier library system mm-hmm. if you're not a local 
check out your local library. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, again, the website, Steve Englehart's website, will tell you these are the issues that he wrote. Here's where it's collected in trade edition. Mm -hmm. So it's a really yeah. useful resource. Anyway, uh, thanks again to our friend Steve Englehart. We really enjoyed talking to you. Thanks for tuning in on Batman Day, and we'll see you next week. Mm -hmm.